welcome to the ICEJ's weekly webinar where we explore uh, different current affairs, some of our projects, Bible teachings, many other topics that we take up. We have a good, very current affairs topic today, really going to sink our teeth into something I think that's very important. Uh, I'm very pleased to have our guest here, Gil Capen, talking about the annual pre-holiday uh, hate fest against Israel at the United Nations. And uh, just to give you a little background on, on Gil, when I was uh, working in Washington in the early to mid 90s, I spent there four years there as uh, registered to lobby uh, in Congress on behalf of strong Israel uh, relations. Gil Capen was a, uh, one of the staff for uh, Congressman Dan Burton, a real conservative Christian fighter out of Indiana. And uh, Gil was with the Middle East Subcommittee uh, in, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And so he was one of my best friends and contacts on the Hill. We did a lot of things together and uh, we just reconnected recently and we're talking about something that he has been dealing with for uh, quite a while now. Uh, with the American Jewish International Relations Institute. It's an arm of uh, B'nai Brit International, the, the world's largest Jewish fraternal organization. They have the, the Anti-Defamation League. This is sort of an arm that reaches out to deal with international relations. And Gil, it's great to have you uh, uh, this week on the ICJ webinar. Thank you, David. Yes. Uh, I would say at the outset that uh, it's an honor to be with all of you. I have great affection and appreciation for all of you, lovers of Zion. And uh, specifically, David, as he just said, we go way back. Uh, when I was a young staffer on the Hill, David was a young uh, activist um, for a pro-Israel organization. He and Richard Hellman um, were the first pioneers really to talk about moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And I don't want to say how many years ago, but it was many, many years ago before it was even legislation. They were the first ones. So it's great to be with you and, and to ICEJ, International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. What can I say? Uh, much appreciation for all of you, especially my wonderful, great friend, Susan Michaels, uh, who I've known for years also. And uh, your work is so important for Israel. And I would say to all uh, Christian friends of Israel, how much I appreciate you. And I hope the Jewish people and the state of Israel appreciates what you do for Israel. Because as I told David, I feel like if it wasn't for Israel's Christian friends, I don't even want to think about where Israel would be. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you. Um, let me give you a little bit of background uh, on our organization, the American Jewish International Relations Institute. As David mentioned, we are affiliated with Nebrith International for the past year, uh, but our organization has been around for about 15 years. Uh, we were founded by the late uh, revered uh, American diplomat Richard Shifter, who passed away a year ago. Ambassador Shifter was a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, he was born in Austria. His parents were able to get him out of Austria when he was 15 years old. They never made it out. They were killed in the Holocaust. He grew up as an orphan in the United States and became uh, the deputy ambassador to the UN. He was Gene Kirkpatrick's deputy and worked in administrations of both parties. He worked in the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations. Uh, he was uh, a U.S. ambassador to the UN U Human Rights Commission. Uh, later on, Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, and really, I would say a giant in human rights, participated in the, an active way in uh, helping uh, Soviet Jews and Soviet Christians get out of the Soviet Union. And together with George Shultz, he negotiated the end of the Cold War human rights immigration issues with Soviet counterparts. So he, during his time at the UN, became very concerned with this annual onslaught against Israel, which is our topic today. And he felt that not enough was being done 
proactively, uh, diplomatically by our side, by the United States, mm -hmm. by Israel, by other friendly countries to combat this and to counteract it. And we have a situation that started during the Cold War and was uh, fueled and generated by the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc uh, in alliance with the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation. Uh, which yeah, Gil, if I, if I can uh, just help yeah. set this up a little, what, what we're talking here is about, uh, it's something seasonal, like the flu or whatever, but it, it should be a happy season. It's Hanukkah, it's Christmas. And yet, right as we move into this season, the people of Israel, the Jewish people worldwide also feel it. There's this annual hate fest at the United Nations that's built around November 29th, which originally was the day the UN voted to partition the land. Israel accepted it, got a Jewish state eventually. Uh, the Arabs rejected it. But now the Palestinians have turned this into an annual day, International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinians. It sets off several weeks as you move into the, the holiday season, several weeks of bashing Israel, all these resolutions, and talking to you recently and learning a lot of new things. I, I say it's time to stop it next Christmas. That's out something different, but I think it's going to be very interesting for everyone to learn exactly how this developed why has it become so accepted? Part of the annual calendar. It's almost like, you know, before, uh, before you can pour the eggnog, you got to watch Israel get flogged at the UN. And this is something that we should not tolerate any longer. But go ahead from, from there, Gil. No, I think you, you said it very well. And I, of course, I love hearing it in your lilting North Carolina cadence. It sounds so much better. <laughs> but I think that's a good place for us to pivot and actually talk about what actually goes on uh, uh, every year. And David is so right. November 29th is the date that they pick uh, to launch this um, annual orgy festival of hating Israel. And it's picked because it's the anniversary of the uh, partition resolution. And I always thought it was kind of ironic that they would want to mark that day because that's the day they rejected the international community offering them a state course, the Jewish people accepted it. That's how the state of Israel was born. And there could have been an Arab state, a Palestinian state at that time. And of course, many other opportunities over the years. But it seems to me they wouldn't want to call attention to that particular date. And yet it is called the uh, International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinians. And I think it's almost a cliche that the UN engages in, in uh, one-sided, unfair, anti-Israel activities, this barrage of resolutions every year. At the General Assembly alone, it's between 15 and 20 every year. This is not even talking about other arms of the UN, Geneva, the UN Human Rights Commission, the, uh, UNESCO, and so forth. But at the General Assembly, 15 to 20 every year. But we, in our organization, have always focused on three. And the reason is that of the 20 or so resolutions every year, most of them are declaratory, condemning Israel for this or that. Uh, among other things, there's a resolution, believe it or not, condemning Israel for an oil spill in Lebanon that happened 40 years ago, and that passes every year, um, and uh, condemning Israel for occupying the Golan Heights, even in the last 10 years of this chaos and civil war in Syria. There's this demand by the UN that Israel turn over the Golan Heights uh, to Assad, I guess. Uh, but our three resolutions, the three that we're most concerned about, are the three that reauthorize and fund every year what we call an anti-Israel infrastructure or apparatus within the UN system. Those are three bodies within the UN that have to be authorized uh, on a regular basis because they have budgets. And they are the Division for Palestinian Rights, the Palestine Committee, which is officially called the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. And the third one is the Special Committee to Investigate Israeli Human Rights Practices in the Occupied Territories. Now, needless to say, I'm sure you won't be surprised to 
clear that there is no parallel in the UN system for any of these bodies. No other country has the honor of being uh, singled out in this manner with uh, a division dedicated to uh, its so-called human rights abuses, a committee that works year round to promote propaganda against Israel and actually organizes uh, the Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people and multimedia presentations. In fact, if you walk into the UN itself, there's a, um, a presentation right near the entrance on the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, which basically uh, reflects the most extreme Palestinian narrative of what happened in 1948. And then there's the Special Committee to Investigate Israeli Human Rights Practices. And I wanna correct myself. I said there's no parallel in the, human, in the uh, UN system. There actually, in the history of the UN, there was one other country that had a special committee and that was South Africa, apartheid South Africa, which is precisely the point. They are trying to compare Israel to apartheid South Africa. And uh, this is what underlies a lot of the activity against Israel and certainly what underlies this infrastructure against Israel. Now, the committee, the Palestine Committee and the Palestine Division were formed in 1975. And all of you either remember or know that in November of 1975, on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, no less, the UN passed an infamous resolution which equated Zionism with racism. And um, 16 years later, uh, thanks to John Bolton, when he was Assistant Secretary for International Operations and the US effort during the Bush administration, first Bush, um, this was repealed. It took a lot of uh, legwork and a lot of effort and whipping for votes, which is significant because it proves that it can be done if you make the effort, but that resolution was repealed. The problem is that although Zionism is racism is no longer official UN policy, the very day in 1975 that Zionism is racism was passed, two other resolutions were passed and they created the Palestine Committee and the Palestine Division. And that was never repealed. So what I call the operational arm of Zionism equals racism continues to not only exist, but to flourish and to, to do its, its, its uh, dastardly work uh, on an ongoing basis. The third one, the Special Committee to Investigate Israeli Human Rights Practices, which as I said, was modeled after a similar committee that existed against South Africa. Uh, that actually was created in 1968. So if you think about all the changes in the world uh, and all the changes in the Middle East in all those 50 plus years, uh, especially in the last few years with the Abraham Accords and this hopeful you know, new opportunities in the Middle East, which hopefully the Palestinians will join one day. This infrastructure continues as if nothing has changed uh, in the Middle East or in, in the rest of the world. And it's, it's almost a surreal thing the UN is its own world, and um, back, I'll, I'll quote here from Ron Prosor, who some of you, uh, I'm sure, know, the former uh, Israeli ambassador uh, to the UN. Uh, in 2012, during this festival, anti-Israeli festival, they also uh, accepted Palestine as uh, a member state of the UN, as an observer member state. Uh, at the Security Council, they were not able to do it, which is what is necessary for a state to actually uh, be a member of the UN. And the reason is that the second Bush administration, which was uh, or actually the Obama administration, to give them credit, uh, worked very hard to get the Security Council members uh, to refrain uh, from supporting it. And that you have to have nine votes on the Security Council. David and I were discussing this the other day. And uh, the Christian uh, support for Israel played a big role in getting Nigeria, which was a member of the Security Council at that time, to not support the resolution. So it failed. But it did pass the General Assembly because they have this automatic majority. And this is what Ron Prosor said about it. He said, the only thing that resulted from this act 
in actual effect, were feelings of hostility and lack of trust. And the message is that the ideological basis of the state of Israel, the establishment of a Jewish state that will be a national home for all of the world's Jews and would give them the right of self-determination like all other peoples is identical to a policy of repression, violence, and intolerance. And I think this is what underlies a lot of the activity against Israel. So to get back to these, um, what we call the three committees, um, the interesting thing is that the 20 resolutions or so that are passed against Israel every year, most of them pass almost blindly with these huge majorities, 150 to seven or you know, 130 to 11 with you know, 60 abstentions. And I think most countries don't even pay attention to the content, but these three have been getting regularly especially in recent years, much less support at the UN. So I think there's already a recognition that there's something wrong with this singling out Israel institutionally within the UN system. And I'll show you some of these votes uh, in a little while, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize why this is harmful, because a lot of people say, well, it's the UN, who cares? Nobody pays attention to the UN, it doesn't mean anything. And I think for many years in Israel, there was a feeling of that too. And it's understandable, you know, when you're bashed constantly year after year in an almost absurd manner. And, you know, like Abba Iban said, if the Algerian ambassador introduced a resolution that the world is flat, it would pass, you know, overwhelmingly. Uh, and that Israel was responsible for it, it would pass overwhelmingly. So there's this cynicism, which I certainly accept and share about the UN, but it does matter. Because what goes on at the UN, especially this propaganda op apparatus, is part of the international assault against Israel. And this is the, one of the most important battlegrounds, I think, for Israel today is the propaganda war. And it may not be uh, a, a, a war of, uh, of weapons and, and, uh, and, and and killing and shooting, but it, it nonetheless, it's very, very dangerous for Israel. We see it on college campuses, we see it in the media, we see it all over the world. And the UN is ground zero for this because these committees, they encourage BDS, they perpetuate this false narrative about Israel, and very significantly, they endorse the so-called right of return for the Palestinians. In each one of these three institutions in its founding documents and in its, uh, on its websites and in its uh, explanatory material, uh, they talk about the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. And they define very well what those inalienable rights are. And one of them is the right to return to their homes and property from which they were evicted. Okay. And this is very flimsy code word for the right of return it means the right of now I think that the tally is up to six million uh, Palestinian refugees to immigrate not to a Palestinian state but to Israel proper to Haifa to Akko to Jaffa to Tiberias and so forth and of course Israel will never accept it so the question is why does this matter because their belief is that this constant drumbeat against Israel, this constant lawfare and uh, uh, assault against Israel in the public mind will wear Israel down and hopefully uh, the international community and even the United States eventually will pressure Israel to make these concessions. This is really the game plan and that's why it's so important to pay attention to it. Now, what we've done is to try to focus attention on these institutions and also to work against them. Uh, and we do that through different means, but one of our primary levers is our alliance with friendly members of Congress from both parties. And what we have found over the years is that uh, the embassies in capitals, US embassies and the State Department are so focused on bilateral 
relations that sometimes the uh, multilateral institutions get short shrift and there's not enough attention paid to these votes at the UN. And by the way, a lot of the votes against Israel are also votes against the United States. Because when you see the annual State Department report on the Bureau of International of Operations, uh, which they're required to submit every year, uh, the voting coincidence with the United States is quite low. You have Israel, which votes very closely with the United States, some Pacific Island countries, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, a little bit even more, a couple of countries in Latin America, and pretty much that's it. The rest of the world votes against the United States 70, 75, 80% of the time. So this is a problem because, of course, China is waiting in the wings, and China, part of their agenda is to take over the UN, and they're very, very active at the UN. So Israel is victimized not only by, frankly, anti-Semitism at the UN, which is an old problem, but also this uh, continued uh, anti-American propaganda and feeling that started in the Cold War. And amazingly, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, we're still seeing it uh, at the UN. So if we could get to the slides, maybe. Um, I can show you some of this uh, graphically. Here we go. So yeah, let's go back to the previous one. Right. This is from the website of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. And as you can see, right over here where it says background, it explains what led up to the formation of the committee and what its, uh, its charter is, uh, is about. And it states very, very clearly that the uh, committee is dedicated to implementing the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. And it enumerates them. And one of them is the right of return. Uh, interestingly enough, also, you can see <laughs> they, uh, <clears throat> when, when this committee was established, they also uh, established something called UNISPAL, which is the United Nations um, uh, Palestine uh, Resource Center. And they put out, you know, they have a website, they put out a lot of materials, and now they even have a interactive um, icon where you can ask them questions. <laughs> it's right there. Okay. Next slide, please. So one thing I need to emphasize is that because we've been making progress on this over the last few years, and you'll see where these votes are going in, uh, over time, <clears throat> Last year, the uh, other side moved at the UN to get a two-year mandate to, for two of these bodies, the Palestine Committee and the Palestine Division, because I think they saw very clearly their numbers eroding. So for the Palestine Division, the Palestine Committee, there's no vote this year. They're continuing their work, of course, but they didn't have to be reauthorized. Uh, for the special committee, uh, the vote is this year. That one actually gets the least amount of yes votes. Um, but they just passed, uh, when this passed through committee a couple of weeks ago, they just passed a two-year mandate for, for them as well. So next year, the division and the committee will be up for a vote. The special committee will not. And by the way, there's a vote on the special committee either late today or tomorrow. This is last year's vote. And you can see 76 members voted in favor, which is quite less than half of the UN membership. Only 10 years ago, over 100 uh, countries were voting for it. And you can see a very large group of abstentions. But <clears throat> what we have found over the years is that many countries, you know, we can understand Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation countries. It's their national policy. They vote against Israel. Um, leftist countries in Latin America, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, of course, we wouldn't expect anything different. But when you go to Africa, for example, and you see countries that are friendly to the United States and receive huge amounts of 
assistance from the United States, also they're friendly to Israel, but at the UN, some of them, not all, but too many of them vote against Israel by rote. And those are the countries that we're trying to reach. Uh, and we've had some success, but we need to keep working at it. Next. Here you can see the trend line starting in 2010 and going through to 2020, the last time all three of these uh, bodies were up for vote. And as you can see, the uh, green line is the committee, Palestine committee. The yellow is the Palestine division. And the purple is the uh, special committee to investigate Israeli human rights practices. As you can see, there's been a significant decline because of this whipping operation and because the US strongly opposes these resolutions, by the way, and in every administration, uh, every year there's a, uh, a short list of about 10 resolutions that the State Department designates as important and all three of these resolutions make the list every year. So there is some effort um, at the UN and in capitals, which is really where we have to keep our focus uh, to get the message across that this is uh, not conducive to peace. This is uh, uh, unfair targeting of Israel and frankly, an abuse of the UN system. Uh, next. And I should also add that um, we had a significant breakthrough uh, two years ago when Germany and uh, about 10 other European countries started getting fed up and started voting no rather than abstaining. The EU position had been to abstain on these resolutions for years. And then two years ago on the division at least, um, Palestine division, Germany, uh, Hungary, Austria, uh, uh, Greece, Lithuania, Estonia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and a few others uh, started voting against it. Uh, we're trying to keep that momentum, uh, move it forward, and even uh, get them to vote no on, on other resolutions. Here's Southern Africa last year, okay? Um, those are the countries that voted yes. And, you know, South Africa, unfortunately, very hostile to Israel at the UN. Uh, Mozambique usually goes along. Angola has its own history. But some of these other countries, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, why should they be voting against Israel? Cape Verde, Congo. Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, Liberia actually broke the ice last year. So kudos to them. They actually voted no. And we hope that uh, they'll stay with it. Liberia did not vote yes on any anti-Israel resolution, so they really uh, deserve a debt of thanks. If we can move on to the next slide. Okay, here you can see the number on the three resolutions. We added up um, the <clears throat> we added up the yes votes uh, for each country, and as you can see. It's uh, broken down into countries that voted yes on all three, countries that voted yes on two, and countries that voted yes on only one, and so forth. And then the largest number are countries at the UN that voted yes on none of them. So they're not all no votes. Only 13 countries, as you can see, the blue graph uh, voted no on all three. And you know we need to bring that up, but a total of 92 countries, which is about half of the UN membership, did not vote yes on any of the three resolutions. So I would say this is real progress. Next, here you can see we added up the total no votes on the three resolutions uh, over the past 10 years, just to show you the the kind of progress, even on the no votes, where it's much tougher to to make that progress. But we started off in 2010 with only a total of 27 no votes on the aggregate of the three resolutions. Okay, so let's say nine countries voted no three times, more or less. And now last year, it's way up, as you can see, going to the right 
going up and hopefully we'll, we'll continue that trend. Next. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's readable, uh, but this is the a statement that uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield made during her confirmation hearing that we were very encouraged. And even uh, in this democratic administration, obviously the last administration extremely strong on Israel at the UN as well. Uh, but on this, we believe that there's no uh, partisan divide. And what she said was, I look forward to standing with Israel, standing against the unfair targeting of Israel, the relentless resolutions that are proposed against Israel unfairly. And she went on to say, I will use my perch if I am confirmed as the UN ambassador to push in this effort. I intend to work closely with the Israeli ambassador, with my colleagues across the globe, because this is not just an issue in New York, but also pushing our colleagues to address these issues with their countries bilaterally so that we can get a better recognition of Israel in New York. That's perfect. Next. So here you can see the graph of the total yes votes uh, over uh, the uh, years from uh, 2010 to 2020. And you can see they're coming down as well. You see, we saw the no votes going up and here we can see the, the total yes votes coming down. Again, a long way to go. 249 is a lot of yes votes uh, against Israel. But we wanna bring that down and, and as you can see, it's moving in the right direction. Next. So here we are, we see, we can compare the, the trends that I'm talking about. You can see that the, uh, on the three resolutions, countries that either voted yes on all three or uh, countries that voted uh, yes on none of them. And you can see it's, it's moving in the opposite direction. You can see way more countries at first voting yes on all three. And now you can see the opposite is true. It's, it's the trend line is again, is, is going in the right direction. Next. <clears throat> I put this up here so that you can see, and I, I realize it's probably hard to read that, but this is from the UN archives on the only other special committee that was ever designated for any other country besides Israel, the special committee on the policies of apartheid of the government of the Republic of South Africa. It existed from 1963 to 1994. <clears throat> and as you can see, they didn't even bother to change the name. <laughs> Both of them were called the special committee uh, to investigate human rights abuses. One for Israel, one for South Africa. This is the parallel that they're always trying to make. Next. Okay, here, here we can see, because Africa is so important, uh, not least of which is the fact that um, 44 Sub-Saharan countries are members of the UN. Out of 193 members, 44 of them are Sub-Saharan countries. Now, I'm not even counting the North African countries or the countries that are members of the Arab League because we're not really concerned about them. You know, they're kind of a lost cause on this, but the rest of Africa, what we call non-Arab League Sub-Saharan Africa is important for the sheer numbers and also because Israel correctly has made a diplomatic push in Africa in recent years. And we know there's a lot of good Christians in Africa that I think wanna support Israel. So we need to find ways to engage with them as well. And you can see here that only 10 years ago, 32 out of the 44 countries were voting um, yes on all three or two out of the three. And only 11 were either voting yes on none of them or just one of them. And now it's almost reversed. We have 24, more than half of the countries voting uh, yes on only one or none and only 20 voting Yes, on three or two of them. Next. Oh, okay. I think that's it. I think that's it. 
Very, very good, though. We've gotten some good responses from people. Terrific. Well, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to discuss or take any questions. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, um, you know, it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, a real education. I've spent years frustrated seeing these votes. I knew it had to do with the Solidarity Day on November 29, and and then you got several weeks of these resolutions coming up. But what you, you and your group have focused on is the internal organs in the UN Secretary itself that fuels the propaganda within the UN, the anti-Israel atmosphere and resolutions and decisions, and, and is a source of, I mean, you have to say not only anti-Israelism, but anti-Semitism within the UN body as, a, as an NGO, us as a ministry, an organ, a nonprofit organization. If we wanted to, you could go get accredited with the UN. But what you are talking about is three agencies, the Committee for the Enable Rights, the Palestinian Division, and this Special Committee on Human Rights Practices, three uh, organizations or departments of, of the UN bureaucracy itself. They have badges, they're UN employees, they're paid by you and I, our countries, our contributions each year. These are paid UN employees who have uh, give the Palestinians this special advantage. And once you remove the, the South Africa committee, there's no other nation that gets this treatment, such unfair treatment. And they're the reason, that, uh, you can confirm this, they're the reason why these votes keep coming up every year and keep passing because they have this unfair advantage within the office of the UN Secretary General himself. Is this correct? Okay, that's great. Uh, first of all, everything you said is true, as usual. But I let me emphasize why this is important. First of all, the Palestine Division, to show you how extraordinarily absurd this is, within the UN Secretariat, there are functional divisions and geographical divisions like the division for Europe, the division for Africa, vision for whatever, climate change, something like that. And then there's the division for Palestinian rights. It's embarrassingly absurd. And it doesn't, one of these things don't belong, that doesn't belong. And nobody seems to get that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to, you know, to, to point out how extraordinary this is. And this does not help the Palestinians. I think this is important to emphasize. They don't help the Palestinians. They don't do any humanitarian work. They don't uh, help the Palestinians in development. It's just propaganda against Israel. And the reason that we think this is so damaging is that, as Ron Prosor mentioned, it, it, it makes Israel feel isolated it increases Israel's isolation, and it encourages the most extreme positions on the part of the Palestinians, because they feel like, well, if the international community is not only backing us, but backing our maximalist demands, like the, the so-called right of return, why should we negotiate? Why should we make concessions? Why should we you know, agree to anything less than what we want, Palestine from the river to the sea? Uh, so, this words have consequences, as we all know, and that's why this is uh, so damaging and, and, and so important. I appreciate all these comments I'm reading that uh, yeah. of what uh, all of you are saying. Yeah. I, I very yeah. much appreciate it. Look, uh, from your, your graphs, it's very visual, uh, very clear to see that there has started to be some progress. Uh, you know, when we talked uh, last week about this, you know, we acknowledge the Abraham Accords are certainly part of it, that even though some of these Arab countries that are normalizing relations with Israel, they're still going to stand up for Palestinian rights. They still may support these resolutions. I think the United Arab Emirates, some of these other countries actually voted for some of these resolutions over recent days. But it's causing other countries, especially, say, Eastern Europe, Africa, Latin America, to reflect and say, look, why should we 
single out Israel and hate Israel so much? Why should we allow this to continue when these Arab countries are, are making peace with Israel? So that's part of the momentum for the, vo for the vote, voting patterns to change. But I think if you look at the important dates here, you probably can trace this back to one, the one and only Nikki Haley. Is this correct? I mean, she was a real champion of Israel, and, and she proved that if you focus on it, concentrate on it, put on the work, how much of an ally was she and how much of a difference did she make in this, this, this trend that we're seeing now? Well, Nikki Haley was certainly a very vocal and um, uh, enthusiastic champion for Israel at the UN. There have been a few, we have to be fair, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was an yes. incredible uh, defender of the free world and also of Israel. If anyone wants to be inspired, just go to YouTube or to our website, because we have a link, and watch his speech on the occasion of the passage of Zionism is racism. It's really unbelievable. And yes. Great line was the United States will never accept, will never acquiesce this infamous act. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing man, and, and he was a great ambassador. So we start with him. Gene Kirkpatrick, of course, was terrific. Uh, John Bolton was great. Um, certainly Nikki Haley uh, was uh, exceptional, and um, her successor was uh, equally uh, dedicated and, and eloquent. Um, and uh, even Linda Thomas Greenfield was in Israel last week and she said this to her credit, this is a very, very uh, welcome uh, from her. She said that Israelis interpret the overwhelming focus on Israel in this body as a denial of Israel's right to exist and an unfair focus on this one country. And they are correct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fortunately, this is not, no way a partisan issue. And let's face it, the UN is a world of its own. It's a fantasy world. It's, you know, logic stops at the door. I was watching Hate Israel Day last week at, at the UN, and the Kuwaiti ambassador got up. Uh, it, you know, they passed a resolution on Jerusalem, as you all have heard, which denies Israel's connection to Jerusalem. And the Kuwaiti ambassador actually said, I'm going to read this so I get this quote correct. He accused Israel of trying to introduce Judaism into the Ibrahimi mosque in Hebron. <laughs> so trying to introduce Judaism is like saying someone is trying to introduce the sun into the heavens. I mean, it's, mm. it's I don't even think that they realize the irony of what they're saying, because mm. like I said, it's it's its own world. Okay. Yeah, this Thomas Greenfield, she just gave a speech in the UN Security Council saying much the same thing. She is now the Biden administration's ambassador to the right. UN. She right. seems to, you know, and she, she, she was there complaining. I mean, this is another uh, sign of the uh, um, unfair treatment of Israel that the Security Council has a monthly meeting scheduled, 12 a year, a monthly meeting on the situation in Palestine to, to criticize Israel, bully Israel in the security. And she says, why should we do this? And why aren't we holding meetings about Iran or, or China or other things? And, and you know, she talked, she used nice diplomatic language, but saying you guys are obsessed with Israel and it needs to stop. So it was very good to hear, hear that uh, from her and from this Biden administration. Um, I mean, we wanna ask the important question, Gil, how can we help as Christians? And, and I, I just started with two points and, and let you comment on this. Um, number one, uh, I learned it when, when we were able to pass the Jerusalem Embassy Act in 1995, it was my last year there uh, on the Hill. And uh, I drafted the first draft of that bill for Senator John Kyle. It became the Dole in a way bill in the Senate, and then there were some supporters on the House side. You probably can name quite a few of the original sponsors, but, uh, you know, it was, we created the momentum 
to move from a resolution, an annual resolution that you mentioned Daniel Patrick Moynihan, when he was senator, he was the one that sort of kicked off an annual resolution to support moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. We wanted to move to an actual bill, a law with teeth to force the, the executive branch to do it. And we created the minimum because we brought Jews and Christians together. And when the Jews and Christians can agree on something, you go to your elected official, it's hard to say no. And I think there's a, a uh, real principle we can turn to on this. Among our branches worldwide, we have uh, offices in 90 countries. We have rep, uh, you know, a following in about 170 countries. And out, somewhere out there, there are some Christians who can get together with your Jews in your community, your city, your country. The two of you go together and meet your elected officials, whether it's, uh, you know, within your legislature, within your, the administration of your, your you know, cabinet uh, offices or the diplomatic offices and say, we need to see a change. This is such an unfair treatment and get them. I, I, Gil, I think, I think the best way is to get a commitment out of whoever you, you talk to, to make sure there's a change at the UN. The second point is, as you mentioned, the UN is a world unto itself. The whole diplomatic world, I, you know, we try to respect diplomats, ambassadors, they have dignity and whatever. But I tell you, I found out there's a lot of corruption there as well over the years and corruption even within the UN. And it's not such, you know, uh, acad you know educated and civilized. It is it, people take bribes. They don't do right. And even if a government uh, in some capital round wants to support Israel, they have to watch what their ambassadors are doing in the UN because sometimes they freelance. And it was Dory Gold who served in this role for Israel, U Israeli ambassador UN, who said, look, sometimes, you know, you don't want to be like the ambassador from Micronesia. You vote for Israel in one of these resolutions. And that night, you got to go to a cocktail party with all your diplomatic colleagues. And they're all laughing at you because you voted with Micronesia for Israel and against the Palestinians. And I mean, these are good points. It, it, the, the diplomatic world thinks they know the right way to do, it's hard to lobby or convince them. And how can we work on this together? Yeah, I think that, um, again, you're absolutely right. And uh, we have a few, a few things. First of all, I didn't remember that uh, it was called the Dole Inouye Bill, but uh, you're right now, I, I do remember. I, in my opinion, it should be called the David Parsons Bill. No, 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 no. no. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> I think that uh, that is absolutely the example that we want to follow. And fortunately, we have found that we're able to work with good Democrats and Republicans. This is not and should, God forbid, never be a partisan issue. And uh, this last go round, um, we worked very closely with the Israel Allies Caucus, which are you know, Christian lovers of Zion, supporters of Israel in the US Congress. And they wrote a terrific letter to the Secretary of State pointing to the importance of this particular resolution and encouraging them, the administration to work hard to uh, encourage other countries to vote against it and to not vote for it. Uh, and many of the members of the caucus um, wrote letters to heads of government at our request, targeted heads of government, you know, as I outlined before. But yeah, it's important. And what you said about the UN is absolutely true. And it's important to say that when we talk about the corruption, which absolutely is uh, a problem, always has been, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, suitcases full of cash or anything that graphic, although that's not unheard of, mm -hmm. but, you know, it takes many forms. It could be, because remember the UN as we have now both said, is a world unto its own. And it's a huge behemoth all over the world. And Israel is one small country uh, 
you know, the Arab League is very strong at the UN, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and strong within the UN. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, this ambassador wants a job for his nephew or, you know, f- uh, you know he wants to get a visa for his mother-in-law to go to X country. It's the so, trade-offs. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of that. And it explains a lot. Not completely, but it certainly explains a lot of the problem that we have. So it is important you know, to work hard to counteract that. And, you know, you mentioned Nikki Haley. One tremendous thing that she did, if you remember, when the United States moved the embassy to Jerusalem, there was a, a resolution at the UN to condemn the United States. And a lot of brave leaders of countries uh, voted against it. Not enough, but a good amount. I don't remember the exact vote, but she actually had a party at her residence for those countries that, that didn't vote for, for that resolution. And I think that kind of thing is not trivial. I think that's important to show appreciation and recognition and to uh, work through you know diplomatic means and communicating appreciation for these countries. Liberia, for example. I mean, I just discovered yesterday by doing a deep dive that not only did they cross the line and vote no on this resolution last year, but of the 15 anti-Israel resolutions last year, only a handful of countries in the world didn't vote for any of them. And Liberia was one of those countries. So we have to figure out a way to say thank you. Mm -hmm. And to answer your important question, there are two things. One, in your tremendous network, your great network, we want to encourage people, and you and I will talk about how to do this, uh, to appeal and reach out to their members of Congress if they're in the United States, absolutely. Because we, you know, we work with about 20, 25 members of Congress. We can certainly do more. You know, this time around, for example, Steny Hoyer wrote some great letters for us, the majority leader, and Marco Rubio wrote the most letters. You know, he's been a great ally. So we have Republicans and Democrats, but you know, if in all 50 states, if we can you know, send that message and mobilize uh, that network, that would be great. And then around the world, you said 90 countries, we should take a look at that list and see what can be done. You know, Kenya, for example, is a huge problem. They vote against Israel all the time. You and I talked about that. You know, I have already been talking to some pastors in Kenya about getting that message to the Kenyan government because, and this is important to note, a lot of times the president or the prime minister doesn't even know about this. You know, they can't be focusing on voting at the UN when they have all these other problems. So as you mentioned, the ambassador sometimes is working on his own for his own agenda. And it's important to get instructions from the capital. Yeah, I, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, in our Christian scriptures, we have a parable that, uh, Jesus told, you know, he, he, uh, he read, studied the Tal, the Talmud. He was like, a, in a way, his style of speaking was uh, like the Pharisees telling uh, parables. And he talked about a widow who was bugging a judge about something so much, just went on over and over to where he finally relented and said, I just might as well give in to her just to, you know, keep her quiet. And I think this is something that uh, we're going to have to be persistent, consistent in in trying to reach out to whoever will listen. And when you find someone, you tell them we are watching, and you watch the UN votes. You look at you know that one graph, that one image you showed where the UN votes are all laid out there. I think you can find those for all these UN votes on different resolutions and all. They always show up in that format. And uh, you can go in there for any decision and find how your nation voted, how other the nations in your region voted. And we need to tell them we are watching you and we want to hold you accountable. And it is going to be persistent. There's the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And what you have to realize, there are forces on the other side working against you. And they're not only, you know, on the other side, they are inside the UN itself, the, this 
Committee for the Enable Rights, the Special Committee on Israeli Human Rights Practices and, and this Palestinian division. They're not going to give up easy because what you're, you're trying to do is put them out of business. And it's going to take a serious effort. But I do think the momentum of the Abraham Accords, a lot of nations just waking up to the unfairness of Israel, to Israel has proven its, its peace credentials, its desire for peace. There's lots of arguments that we can make to help shift this. But I think the key is to let these people know we are watching and holding them accountable because most people, they, you know, they, when it comes to the UN, they just tune out. They tune out. But uh, Gil, what you've presented here is uh, um, incredibly informative, eye-opening, but also very challenging. It gives us a nice challenge that uh, the leadership of the Christian embassy here in Jerusalem has already uh, said, this is an issue we want to work with over this coming year, that when we get to this next Christmas season, next November 29, as we move into Hanukkah and Christmas uh, next year, uh, things are going to be different. And we're all going to be watching. Uh, Gil says there's a vote tomorrow, probably uh, on uh, it's it's on this special committee on the human rights practices of Israel, whether to renew its mandate and its funding and keep it going. It'll, you know, we expect it to pass, but it'll inter be interesting to see if those numbers keep falling, the number of countries in support of it. And we want to make a difference. We want everyone out there to work with us, help us in your country, get to your leader, your elected leaders, uh, you can't really, you're not going to be able to replace a diplomat. I know we got a question about that. How do you replace your representatives at the UN? You have to replace your elected officials who are the ones who appoint your diplomats. And you don't have to replace the diplomat. You just have to hold him accountable because there are instances where the diplomats in, in New York at the United Nations are even voting different than what their governments want them to, and it's just that no one's watching. So we have to really put this on our own agenda and make sure it's different next year, that as we get ready to celebrate the holidays, Israel won't be going through, Israel will have even better news to celebrate that the, the hate fest at the UN is getting undermined and dissipating and hopefully will end soon. This is our goal. Thank you, Gil, for your time and uh, your very informative presentation today. Thank you, David. It's been an honor to be with all of you. And let me just say that, you know, we already are at the point where less than half of the UN membership is voting consistently for these three. Our next goal is to get them below two thirds of the yeses and noes. So we have to bring the yeses down and the noes up. We're not uh, there yet, but we're certainly on the right track. And uh, it's been a tremendous honor to be with all of you. I appreciate all of you. God be with you and Merry Christmas to all of you. Yes. Thank you, Gil. Okay. Just uh, share this with your friends. Uh, this uh, uh, webinar is going to be placed on our YouTube channel, the ICJ's YouTube channel on Facebook uh, as a Facebook live presentation. Just share it with uh, your family and friends. Let them know that we're launching this campaign to uh, stop the flogging of Israel at the UN during the pre-holiday season every year and year round. And uh, it's a great challenge for us, but uh, we're going to pray our way through it. We're going to work our way through it. And we really uh, hope that you join us in this. We'll have uh, a commentary coming out from the embassy on this. Uh, in tomorrow's uh, ministry update. Uh, and we'll also have links there to this webinar. Please uh, get others to join. Next week, we have our regular global prayer gathering next Wednesday at four o'clock Israel time. Please join us then. And next Thursday, we'll have the, our weekly webinar once again, 4 p.m. next Thursday. And my colleague, Nicole Yoder, will be talking about the challenges of the Ethiopian urgent airlift. They want to bring 3,000 Ethiopian Jews to Israel, where you've already committed to help by uh, in the first flight or two, we're going to uh, be sponsoring at least 200 of these 
Ethiopians coming out of the civil war and, and worsening famine there, and uh, also helping with the absorption phase. Our guest will be Takala uh, Mekonen, who uh, is an uh, Ethiopian Jewish community leader here in Israel. And he's gonna talk about the current situation and what we can do. And, and it's not only getting the, them here, but helping them over a several, several year period to get acclimated and settled in Israel. So please join us next week for that. Meantime, God bless you. Happy holidays from Jerusalem. We are definitely in a time of dramatic change. Many leaders, they speak that this current crisis that is going all around the world means like a reset or a recalibration even of the word of God here in this world. It's a new season where we do sense new tools are required and a new type of leadership. And in this challenging time, it's important for us to remember that God is not locked down. He is still active. He's not restricted in his ways of dealing with the church, but he can bring new things to your ministry and new things even to your personal leadership. We see prayer increasing around the world and hear testimonies of people coming in large numbers into the kingdom of God. I do pray that this year's Envision Conference right here from Jerusalem will inspire you to be a better leader, to cope the challenges that we are facing and to expect great things from God for your ministry. I look forward to seeing you at Envision 2022 and I believe that the Lord will give us guidance. Discover, grow, and lead at the Envision Pastors and Leaders Conference. Join us as we take you to different locations in the land of Israel. Hear insightful teachings that will enrich your faith. Enjoy worship and fellowship together with pastors and leaders from across the globe. Register today. Go to on.icej.org slash envision2022.